<laughs> ah, Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. The first of what would become several follow-up series to the popular Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Monsters anime and manga, the show follows Jaden Yuki, a new student at the famous Duel Academy, who ultimately hopes to become the next King of Games. Though certainly not through doing anything silly like getting good grades or not falling asleep during class. Of course, things in the show don't always stay that simple, and as things go on, stuff gets quite a bit more serious, actually. How much more serious, you may ask? Well, consider that the general plots kind of go from stuff like the mean teacher is trying to get me expelled, or this one kid has an overbearing father, to you have to use the power of alien creatures of your own design and the demon deep inside you that once tried to kill everyone everyone due to their own twisted sadomasochistic view of love to defeat the literal personification of darkness before he can assimilate every living thing into his fucked up world by psychologically torturing them until they lose the will to live. Yeah, so, you know, bit of a left turn. I still remember watching this show back when it first aired in America in 2005 and instantly becoming a fan. Honestly, I think part of it is just how slice of lifey a lot of season one was, and also just how much fun the writers and the voice actors of the English dub seem to have with the material. You're in for some heartbreak! Uh, actually, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, just attack. Where's your dual disc, anyway? Who needs a dual disc when you have this? Uh, you realize that's a table, don't you? Then we've got problems. I've never felt this run down after a duel. Why, Why does everyone, everyone think, think out, out loud at this place? place? Not to mention the fact that nobody in this show's universe even begins to question the utterly absurd concept of an entire high-tech academy being built on an island in the middle of the ocean where teenagers would go for several years in order to learn how to play a children's card game. Like... We're all just kind of cool with it and taking it very, very seriously. Of course, very few students at Duel Academy took this all quite as seriously as one of its highest ranking students and one of the show's most prominent characters, Chaz Princeton. Voiced in the English dub by Tony Salerno for the first 89 episodes and by Mark Thompson thereafter, Chaz Princeton is initially presented as Jaden Yuki's primary rival. Think the Seto Kaiba to Jaden's Yugi Moto. But believe me, Chaz, both as a duelist and as a person, takes a much different path than Kaiba does, and by the end of the show's 180 episodes, Chaz learns to embrace something far more important than the power and prestige that he'd built his life upon. So, grab your dual disc, throw down some face downs, and get ready to Chaz it up as I take a look at the character arc of Chaz Princeton in Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. And of course, as always, big time heckin' spoilers ahead. He's a punk. We went to dual prep school for the past three years. We're ready for the academy. These kids don't know what they're getting into, but they'll learn the hard way, the Chaz Princeton way. Of course, before we talk about Chaz's character arc, it might be a good idea to establish who he is first. Chaz Princeton is a student at the famous Duel Academy. It starts out the show as a student ranking in Obelisk Blue, the highest rank a student can achieve at the Academy. He's often seen being flanked by two friends slash goons, Tayo and Raizo, who are never actually given those names in the show, by the way, but who are given those names in the Yu-Gi-Oh! GX Spirit Caller video game, of all things. Anyway, between his prestigious rank and his lavish upbringing, Chaz is an arrogant, snobby, elitist dickhead who thinks he can buy his way out of any problem and views anyone outside of the Obelisk Blue dorm as being lesser than him and not worth his time. Especially those in the Slifer Red dorm, the lowest ranking dorm in the school. In fact, Chaz has such a superiority complex when it comes to the Slifer dorm that he constantly comes up with new and exciting ways to insult them. Hey, Slifer Slacker. More like lucky moves if you ask me, you Slifer School scum. Ready for round two, you Slifer Slime? The Chaz shouldn't live! like a slifer rat. Of course, Chaz has knocked off his shiny blue pedestal real quick when the new kid comes to class. Enter Jaden Yuki, the show's protagonist, slifer red student, and the guy who duels with the best of them, despite the fact that he probably couldn't tell you the last time he was awake during class. The two of them have an inconclusive duel in episode two that gets cut short because of campus security, but in their first proper duel in episode four, despite Dr. Crowler loading Chaz's deck with rare and powerful 
multiple cards. Chaz gets rocked by Jaden and his elemental heroes, immediately taking a huge hit to his ego and his reputation. And things only get worse from there, as he subsequently loses to Raw Yellow student Bastion Misawa, despite throwing Bastion's deck into the ocean the night before to try and force a win by forfeit. You know, for someone who holds himself in such high regard, Chaz has an awful on-screen win-loss record in the first part of Season 1. I mean, he lost to Jaden in Episode 4, he lost to Bastion in Episode 12, and based on what Jaden said he was about to draw before their duel was cut off, and how the turn subsequently would have gone, Chaz most certainly also would have lost to Jaden in Episode 2. But of course, Chaz Princeton responded to these setbacks about as well as one would expect. By which I mean he immediately packed his stuff and left Duel Academy on his personal yacht. I mean, you know, honestly, as a former smart kid who has a bad habit of dropping something when I'm not instantly successful or amazing at it, I'd probably do the same thing, really. I need you, Zuko. I've plotted every move of this day, this glorious day in Fire Nation history, and the only way we win is together. But yeah, no, seriously though, Chaz took the notion of losing to a Slifer and a Rob back to back, with the latter loss resulting in him being demoted from Obelisk Blue, so poorly that the better solution in his mind was to sail into the open sea until his yacht somehow got shipwrecked in the middle of nowhere. That's what he was willing to do, rather than try to live down his shortcomings. Of course, if you want to know just who instilled in him this fear of failure, this deep-seated need to be the best in the world at the cost of everyone around him, you don't need to look any further than Chaz's two older brothers, Slade and Jagger. It's revealed in episode 12 that Slade and Jagger are putting Chaz under immense pressure to succeed at Duel Academy and become a pro duelist, so that the three of them can succeed in their long-established plan to have their conglomerate, the Princeton Group, control the three most important pillars of modern society, politics, finance, and most importantly of all, Duel Monsters. It's Yu-Gi-Oh, just go with it. Having lost to Bastion and presumably being demoted to Raw Yellow, unable to bear the thought of facing his brothers again, Chaz runs away and washes up on the shore of North Academy. Duel Academy's top rival school, where to even gain entry, he has to build a 40 card deck out of random cards that are scattered all over the frozen landscape, which he does do to his credit, but in the process, he also picks up a rather annoying passenger. One of the cards Chaz finds is Ojama Yellow, who Chaz almost immediately regrets finding due to the fact that he inexplicably talks to him and just will not shut up. Now, Chaz isn't the only character in the show who can talk to dual spirits like this, as Jaden Yuki himself can also do that, but I'm willing to bet Chaz would rather have Jaden's Wing Karibo as a companion rather than this talking piece of phlegm. However, Chaz is irreversible bonded with Ojama Yellow, much to his chagrin, and he has no choice but to bring it with him, as he proceeds to beat 50 of North Academy's duelists in the non-stop gauntlet, at one point beating four guys all at the same time, ultimately becoming North Academy's top student, and having them all literally bowing at his feet. And for his efforts, Chaz is rewarded with a spiffy new deck from North Academy, an awesome new black jacket, a chance to get revenge on Jaden at the annual school duel, and, obviously much more important than any of these other things, his very own catchphrase. Jazz it up! Jazz it up! Jazz it up! Oh please, like this is even the first time a heel has had a popular chant that got over with the crowd. Today, WrestleMania is... Of course, even when Chaz and his new catchphrase return to the shores of Duel Academy for the school duel, Slade and Jagger come back to ramp up the pressure, blindsiding him with the fact that his duel with Jaden is going to be broadcast live around the world, and giving him a bunch of rare cards to use, all while reminding Chaz, of course, that his only real worth to them is what he can do for their family. It's no wonder that Jaden spots Chaz having a total meltdown in the bathroom before their duel, with Chaz trying so desperately to convince himself that not only can he win, but that he has to, because that's the only way he can succeed, because that's the only way he can be worthy. So it probably doesn't come as a shock to you to know that when Chaz ultimately lost the school duel to Jaden, 
in part because he refused to use the rare cards his brothers gave him and wanted to do it on his own, Slade and Jagger basically disown him as a brother, leaving him to rot at Duel Academy for his failures. But thankfully, Duel Academy welcomes him back with open arms, with a new group of friends and a cozy bed waiting for him. A bed, of course, that just happens to be in the Slifer Red dorm since, you know, technically Chaz dropped out and then re-enrolled, making him a new student, forcing him to bunk up with the very same Slifer slackers he'd been so awful to this whole time. But hey, even that still has to beat having brothers like Slade and Jagger. I mean, they literally sat there during the school duel hoping that Chaz's presumed victory wouldn't be too quick just so they can make more money from the commercials. You know, that's really fucked up. I mean, what kind of selfish, greedy scumbag would purposely stretch out their content just so they can make more money from the ad rep. Uh, do you think you could be just a little less evil than that? I don't know. You think you could survive a 700-foot fall? <laughs> Good old Bender. After the whole school duel thing and his demotion to Slifer Red, Chaz's character sort of takes a turn into being somewhat of a comedy relief character in the second half of Season 1, still trying to cling to his pride and ego, of course, but not quite having that same threatening aura that he might have had before, and that old seriousness basically went out the window when it became obvious that he had a massive yet totally unreciprocated crush on Alexis Rhodes, to the point where he and her older brother Atticus came up with a cockamamie scheme to use the spirit keys, you know, the things that could lead to the revival of the super dangerous Sacred Beast cards, that it was absolutely vital that they remain sealed away. Yeah, they decide to have Chaz pretend to steal them to convince Alexis to duel him and for her to go out with him if he won, which actually double backfired on him, because not only did he lose, but the spirit keys just went ahead and unlocked the seal on the Sacred Beast cards, meaning Jaden still had to try and save the world by fighting the dude who was looking for them anyway. Alright, look, in Chaz's defense... How many of you can honestly say that you've never basically brought about the apocalypse trying to get your crush to like you back? Huh? How many of you? Come on, show of hands. Don't be shy. Yeah, that's what I thought. In the latter half of Season 1 and the first bit of Season 2, Chaz is still a dick, sure, but more in like a jerk-ass frenemy way rather than a totally heartless asshole way. There's more comedic banter between Chaz and Jaden, and he honestly does try to help the main characters out in his own Chaz Princeton way. He even eventually completes the Ojama Trio by finding Ojama Green and Ojama Black, reuniting them with Ojama Yellow, despite how outwardly annoyed he seems to be by the three of them being together. And to top it all off, whether he wanted to admit it to himself or not, he was honestly becoming friends with the very same kind of lower-ranking students that early Season 1 Chaz would have spat on for looking in his direction. He really seemed to be changing for the better, but one part of the old Chaz still remained. His unshakable desire to get his win back from Jade and Yuki. Some part of him, deep down in his soul, was still bitter and angry that this goofy, silly, carefree dork was one of, if not the, most respected and admired duelist in the whole academy. A status that he was told his whole life should have been his. And he wanted so badly to put that Slifer slacker back in his place once and for all. So maybe then, it's not that surprising that when Season 2's big bad, Sartorius, offered Chaz the power to defeat Jaden if Chaz were to succumb to the influence of the Light of Destruction, the very same force that had its hold on Sartorius himself, Chaz actually takes him up on it. Of course, it wasn't an instant choice, as Chaz was struggling within himself. The part of him that might have actually considered the likes of Jaden to be a real friend was fighting the part that viewed Jaden as an obstacle, a roadblock holding him back from the glory that he was told the Princeton name entitled him to. And in the end, his need to beat Jaden won. And thus, Chaz Princeton saw the light. He has stolen my honor. And his death must be as the first of many Dual Academy students to join the so-called Society of Light, Chaz seemed to have gotten some of his old edge back, along with his spiffy new white jacket, looking like a proper threat by defeating and brainwashing most of the Obelisk and Ross students, including Alexis Rhodes, one of the most skilled Obelisk Blue students. Honestly, Chaz in the Society of Light has always kind of reminded me a little bit of the whole Majin Vegeta thing from Dragon Ball Z. 
just hear me out. Both Chaz and Vegeta serve as the primary rival to their respective show's protagonist, both have massive egos and superiority complexes due to their heritage, and both are so utterly annoyed at being surpassed at every turn by someone they view as beneath them that they willingly sell their soul to a magical villain just to get the power they need to stomp their rival out, while also reverting back to some of their old habits in the process. Although, credit Chaz with at least not casually blowing up several dozen people in a stadium for fun, but like, creating a student cult built on serving a dude possessed by an evil alien entity that was gonna use a satellite to brainwash the entire planet? Still pretty bad, not gonna lie. During his Society of Light arc, Chaz heartlessly throws away his Ojama cards, choosing instead to use a White Knight-style deck given to him by Sartorius, but despite how much he tried to convince himself otherwise, he just couldn't shake the feeling that he missed the Ojamas. He felt himself actually missing the presence of those three loud, annoying, clinging, irritating little dweebs, although he couldn't bring himself to understand exactly why. Hint, hint, Chaz. That's the power of friendship. And it's that same power of friendship that allowed Jaden and the Ojama Trio to help Chaz break free of the Light of Destruction's influence and leave the Society of Light mid-duel, with Chaz just spending the rest of it constantly summoning and resummoning the Ojamas, just so we could find a way to use them to destroy the White Knight Lord that was still on the field, even if it meant losing the duel itself to Jaden again. Almost like he not only had to definitively sever any remaining connection to Sartorius, but also like he was trying to destroy the weakness within himself that allowed him to succumb to his influence in the first place. Also a really cool moment in this duel is Chaz flat out calling the Ojama Trio the aces of his deck, which, you know, is a pretty nice turnaround for being thrown into the wind and being called a waste of time a few episodes back. Thankfully though, even though Chaz was the one to convert most of the school to the Society of Light, he does atone for this by being the one to defeat most of them and get them back to normal. Oh, and in the process of doing that, I guess he also won the whole Gen X tournament that was happening right in the middle of all this evil alien cult stuff, because of course it was, it's Yu-Gi-Oh, just go with it. Alright, listen, I'm gonna be super honest with you. Nothing happens with Chaz in Season 3. Like, yeah, he's there, he exists, but there's nothing really significant for his character during this season. He spends most of the Survival Duels arc laying in the infirmary, and then he just ends up as one of Yubel's duel ghouls later on. Honestly, I think the most interesting Chaz-related thing in Season 3 is probably his duel with Adrian Gecko, if for no other reason than the fact that Adrian won't stop pointing out Yu-Gi-Oh! anime cliches. I reveal two of my face downs. But how? Easy. I just call out their names dramatically and they pop up. Haven't you played this game before? Because it's a pretty common occurrence. And then, of course, towards the end of Season 3, after Jaden and the others return to the dimension of dual monsters looking for Jaden's friend Jesse, who stayed behind the last time they were there to stop Yubel's plan, Chaz is just one of several of Jaden's friends to get killed and sacrificed for the creation of super polymerization, not to mention to be the catalyst for Jaden succumbing to the power of the Supreme King for his own character arc, which is actually kind of a weirdly appropriate encapsulation of some of the problems with GX as a whole, where a lot of the other important characters are just kind of swept aside sometimes for the sake of Jaden, but that's a conversation for another day. Now see, if you really want some significant late series character development for our boy, the Chaz, you gotta look at season four. Season four, which is the shortest of all the four seasons, and also wasn't dubbed by four kids because they wanted to start airing 5Ds and didn't want to wait to finish GX's dub, so thanks a lot, looks at each of the main characters' struggles as they decide what they're gonna do with their future after Duel Academy, namely the third-year Duel Academy students who are set to graduate. 
including one Chaz Princeton. As we see in episodes 165 and 166, Chaz still wants to be a pro duelist to make his name on the pro circuit, but seemingly every single potential sponsor he reached out to rejected him, and he outright refuses to go groveling to his jerk-ass brothers to make that happen for him, so it seems that the only way that he can get his foot in the door is Crowler basically begging longtime pro duelist Aster Phoenix to take Chaz on as an assistant. It's not long before Chaz comes to understand just how harrowing the life of a pro duelist really is, not only from having to juggle Aster's absolutely ridiculous schedule and seeing just what Aster puts himself through to maintain his skill level, but even as a duelist himself, as he soon finds himself on the pro scene after all. But as a goofy underdog character wearing an Ojama Yellow costume, because, you know, of course he is. And yeah, this gimmick makes him popular and he's entertaining the fans, but he's not able to do it his own way and be true to himself, mainly because his newfound sponsor, Mike, constantly fixes the duels that he's in, because, according to him, entertaining the crowd is more important than winning, regardless of whether or not Chaz could actually do it on his own. Wow, spoken like a true scummy wrestling promoter. And in that same spirit, Mike engages in a convoluted scheme of lies, stolen cards, and blackmail to arrange a duel between Ojama Chaz and Aster Phoenix, ordering Aster to put on a good show before throwing the match in order to boost Chaz's career, lest he shut down an orphanage that Aster had just given a bunch of money to. Thankfully though, before the Duel Academy screw job can happen, in earnest, Jaden intervenes and breaks kayfabe, exposing Mike's treachery to the audience. Of course, in an attempt to not go down in flames alone, Mike cuts a shoot promo on Chaz, revealing that Chaz did in fact go along with all the fixed duels for the sake of his own career, but not even this can dissuade the people from cheering Chaz on. Indeed, the Chaz is so completely over with the crowd that Mike's blatant attempt to bury him falls completely flat, and it only succeeds in making him an even bigger star than he was before. Can you tell I watch entirely too much pro wrestling? Because, uh, I'm pretty sure you could tell. No, but honestly though, it's almost like how Brian Danielson lost the World Heavyweight Championship in 18 seconds at WrestleMania 28, only for the fans to launch him into the stratosphere, ultimately helping him become one of the most popular babyface stars of his generation. And for Chaz, it was really much the same. Despite what he'd done in the past and what he'd done recently to try and achieve his dreams, both his fellow Duel Academy students and his adoring Pro League fans were still very much behind him, and they all wanted nothing more than for him to chaz it up and to do it his way. And considering that Chaz had spent such a big part of this series trying to cling to an image that his brothers were projecting onto him, thinking that that was the key to his success, the fact that he now had the confidence to stand on his own two feet and make his own way in the dueling world is honestly the best bit of character development of anyone in this show. Of course, I would be remiss if I didn't give the proper credit to those who had such a big hand in making this happen. As cheesy as this all sounds, and as cliche as it is for talking about anime, one of the biggest reasons Chaz was able to grow and change as much as he did was, well, like I said before, the power of friendship. Chaz didn't really have much in the way of friends at the start of the show. Hell, even his fellow Obelisk Blue students were more attached to his prestige and his family name rather than his own merit as a person. And we saw how quickly that flew out the window once Chaz got beat by a Slifer Red. But throughout the show, Chaz gained a new group of friends from unexpected places not only in the form of his own greatest rival, Jaden Yuki, and Jaden's close group of friends, who constantly stuck by his side and wanted to be his friend in spite of what he'd done in the past, but also, and probably most importantly, in the form of that pesky Ojama trio. As much as Chaz wanted to hate those three little gremlins, they showed him nothing but kindness, camaraderie, loyalty, and support, even in his lowest moments where he struggled the most. 
something he for damn sure never got from his own brothers, and the fact that he found that kind of friendship in three dual spirits of monsters who, on their own, are considered some of the weakest in the game, literally monsters with zero attack points, and that he eventually not only accepted them as part of his deck, but even started building his deck around them, is such an important marker for his own personal growth. The early Season 1 Chaz would have spat on the Ojama cards. Hell, early Season 1 Chaz probably would have been the one to throw them down that well of abandoned cards that Ojama's green and black were at the bottom of when he found them in the first place. But as Chaz progressed throughout the show, and as he was forced to confront the kind of person he used to be, and the person that he was afraid of becoming, the Ojama trio were there every step of the way, wanting nothing more than for their boss to succeed, and show everyone what it meant to Chaz it up. In that moment in episode 166 during his battle with Aster, with Chaz reaffirming to Ojama Yellow that it was the ace of his deck, like he'd done once before in episode 88, was the moment I believe Chaz Princeton had well and truly accepted that he wasn't meant to just be another pawn in his brother's domination plot, and that he didn't have to be like them, but that he could be his own man, and do things his own way. Oh, and you want to know how he actually defeated world-renowned pro-duelist Aster Phoenix? He did it with Ojama Goddamn Yellow. You know, the monster card with zero attack points. A really clever use of the trap card Pride Shout literally let Chaz defeat years long pro duelist Aster Phoenix with a direct attack with a monster without a single attack point to its name, once and for all solidifying his bond with the Ojamas and embracing them as his friends and his aces. And that's only further solidified after the graduation duels, where he, Alexis Rhodes, and Cyrus Truesdale all tied for the top score. Score, meaning that they all qualified to get the replica of Yugi Moto's famous Duel Monsters deck, only for all three of them to turn it down in favor of their own decks. And obviously the message here is that all three of them had built a bond with their own cards and wanted to stick with them instead of using Yugi's cards, but... I think making that choice was most significant for Chaz specifically, because Chaz was the kind of person who clung to power and prestige, who had it hammered into his head from an early age that taking life by the throat and bending it to your will was the only way to thrive, and he played dual monsters accordingly, seeking out only the best and most powerful cards to crush those that he thought were below him. But his slow but sure embrace of not only the Ojama trio and their related support cards, but also of the non-obelisk blue academy students that he once so readily looked down upon, slowly changed his philosophy and his outlook on life and on dueling itself. So Chaz being so readily willing to turn down the chance to use such a legendary deck that presumably would hold so much power is such a big milestone for him because now Chaz knows that any card can be powerful in the right duelist's hands, and he knows in his heart that... Again, as cliche as it sounds, the power of friendship is the strongest thing of all. So, what did you think of Chaz Princeton's character arc throughout Yu-Gi-Oh! GX? Let me know in the comments below. Give this video a like if you liked it, subscribe for more videos like this in the future, share this on your favorite social medias, and ring the bell so you'll always get notified when I upload. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video, friendos.